Finance ministers across the world are aiming howitzers at the economy. But is it going to be enough to engineer a recovery or are we set for a bout of prolonged economic recession? We asked Vicky Price, the former head of the Government Economic Service in the UK and Scottish economic commentator George Kerevan, who's got the policies right and whether new economic thinking can emerge from the COVID-19 crisis. Join us on The Alex Salmon Show, on air and online. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from stricken Aberdeenshire in Scotland, where we take a fresh look at the economics of the COVID-19 crisis. When we last looked at this issue a few weeks ago, governments around the world were just starting to announce their emergency economic packages to deal with the economic impact of lockdown. In today's show, we asked Vicky Price, the former head of the Government Economic Service in the UK, which countries may have judged it right. Is a rapid recovery possible or are we set inevitably for a bout of prolonged economic recession? And we asked leading Scottish economic commentator George Kerevan what new thinking might emerge from this crisis. But first to Tasmina in Glasgow with your tweets, your emails and your messages. Thank you, Alex. First of all, in response to our extended interview with Sir Harry Burns, the former Chief Medical Officer for Scotland, Mike says, this is a fascinating interview, long, in-depth and totally riveting. An absolute eye-opener and I really, really hope people in power take it on board and take action. Tracy says, this is the best interview I've listened to and makes a lot more sense than what we have to listen to on the news, where the politicians seem to tell us very little. And Wilma says, wish you were still our CMO, Harry. Then in response to our show last week on media and the pandemic, featuring award-winning journalist Peter Oborn and Chris Hedges from both sides of the Atlantic, Lewis says, love the show. Interesting look at what the press are saying. I'm in no doubt that they will increase their criticism of the Prime Minister and his government. Rona says, it must be scary living in the USA. So little humanity in policy development. She then goes on to say, agree, we have huge inequality too. Norma says, the print media is dying, but it's mostly their own fault. Bias and lies, that's what they print. I haven't bought a newspaper for years, but I get all and truthfully on social media. Gemma says, newspapers have brought on their own demise by reporting biased news. And finally, Scott says, there is no way to run a pandemic government. Just save lives and live right. The lockdown of the better part of the world economy is an event without precedent in world history. Never before has a world recession been engineered as a deliberate act of policy to tackle a health crisis. Vicky Price is the Chief Economic Advisor of the Centre for Economic and Business Research. She's also former head of the Government Economic Service in the United Kingdom. Who better to assess the prospects for economic recovery? Vicky Price now joins me from London. Vicky Price, what do the first quarter economic figures ha tell us uh, about the impact of the lockdown on the world economy? Basically, we're seeing a contraction which is spread across the world. And I think one of the interesting issues is, first of all, how much sharper will the Q2 contraction be? And it's likely to be pretty sharp because we are beginning to feel some of those outcomes just now in the Western world anyway. Uh, the question then, uh, of course, is what uh, type of long-term impact that will have and whether that recovery that we're all hoping will happen at some point is quite sharp, as uh, the International Monetary Fund hopes, or whether we're going to have quite a protracted uh, period during which we're trying to get out of this um, recession, which is the largest we've seen, really, since uh, the Great Crash in the early part of the 20th century and uh, um, whether, therefore, that is going to leave scars for quite some time and the economies simply aren't going to recover and trade won't recover anything like what we used to see before for a number of years since the financial crisis. So uh, it's telling us we're in recession, basically. That's what the data is suggesting. Uh, the countries, the major economies, have been flinging what could only be described as 
economic howitzers at the, uh, at the recession, at the crisis. What policies have impressed you the most thus far? I think all governments have been very prepared to uh, engage in quite a lot of borrowing in order to sustain the economy. So fiscal rules have been abandoned. I think the governments have learned from the financial crisis. It's exactly what was needed then, but it was slightly easier because we had one problem to deal with, the banking system, trying to avoid the credit crunch from causing huge financial instability. Um, that was more easily handleable, um, but this is quite unprecedented because we have it both ways. That we're not trying to expand demand, which is what we were trying to do then, but what we're trying to do now is sustain the population and businesses while we're pushing demand and supply down at the same time. Now, this is quite unprecedented for central banks to be buying assets on, on this scale. But would you say it's justified, given the unprecedented nature of the economic crisis? Oh, completely and utterly justified. Uh, we must remember that the European Central Bank has been doing this for a long period of time, of course. It's not new for them. And uh, since 2015, they have been buying quite aggressively. But we've now abandoned concerns about how much we do. Uh, the UK, for example, has been able to sell its bonds and finance. A huge uh, deficit it's going to have this year, estimated as something like £300 billion, pounds, uh, mainly because the central bank has been behind it, printing money, you could call it, uh, and promising to buy all those bonds that others will acquire back from them. So they know that there's someone there to make the market for them, that the risk is very small, uh, and therefore the Bank of England has been able, with the support, sorry, the Treasury rather, has been able, with the support of the Bank of England, to uh, go out to the markets and issue those of bonds at very low rates, uh, which it can then uh, sort of use, um, or the money of it uh, used to fund and guarantee quite a lot of the activities that are going on right now in the market um, to sustain the economy, basically. Without that, whether you, Bank of England, Bank of Japan, the ECB, the Fed, but also there's been quite a lot of support in China and elsewhere, uh, without that, uh, I think we would have seen a much, much faster de deterioration in economic conditions in many countries. Now, thus far, some countries have been substantially more successful in containing the virus than others. Uh, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, in Europe, Greece uh, and Germany. Will these countries be insulated from the economic effects or will they be caught up in a, a general downturn in the world economy and world trade? The worrying thing about the world economy is that it was already slowing down and slowing down very significantly before the crisis hit. Uh, what we have seen is that the trade disputes between China and the U.S. in particular had already reduced Chinese growth quite substantially, had already reduced growth in loads of other parts of the world. Japan wasn't exporting an awful lot to China because China wasn't growing particularly. Uh, Germany wasn't exporting much to China. What we have seen in Europe, in fact, is a few quarters of contraction in some of the big economies there, but included, actually, Germany. It also included the U.K., uh, because we were also affected here um, by that slowdown in trade. And that had been a worry in any case. And one of the reasons why monetary policy had been relaxed already uh, before we go to this crisis had been because um, the central banks were trying to sustain growth in uh, the various regions and countries for which they were responsible. And we saw the ECB get into the market again you know, quite aggressively back in November, if I remember correctly, of last year. It is a, a very unusual situation. So if there isn't a resumption of trade pretty soon, um, to the extent that that sustains the world economy, as we see now how important trade is, then countries that have done quite well in terms of containing the virus are still going to be affected by the slowdown in trade. And we're hearing, of course, resumption of, or the possible resumption of trade facilities between uh, the US and China, which, uh, of course, is going to be affecting markets all across the world. Now, some economists and indeed uh, some political leaders have been putting forward hopes that there might be a substantial economic recovery at the back end of this year and into 2021. Is there any real prospect of a V-shaped recovery, as it's called, 
or are we more likely in for a period of prolonged world recession? We don't know. Uh, that's the interesting thing. If you look at China and the data has come out of it, they went to quite a decline in the first quarter. So what we saw is quite a dip in industrial production in particular. If you look at what's been happening recently, the April data, after two months of very serious decline, show an increase again. So uh, China is moving out of it. Uh, there is no real reason why other countries, if there is the lockdown, shouldn't either. So I think it's worth bearing in mind that when we compare what's going on right now with what happened in the financial crisis back in 2008, 2009, the advanced world went into recession very quickly. It didn't last very long. It was a V-shaped one. But at the time, this, we had the developing world, oil prices were still quite high, commodity prices were high, actually doing reasonably well. And it was just as the advanced world was recovering that some of these countries went into recession because oil prices fell, commodity prices fell. So there was a bit of a balancing out that was taking place. This time, it seems to be the case that the developing world is also going to see a fall uh, this year. Getting out of that for them might actually be much more difficult than it was the case back in at the time of the financial crisis because many have very high debts now. Most of countries have much higher debts now than they did at the beginning of the financial crisis. And of course, they will have difficulty, um, particularly as they have to intervene in their own economies to pay back some of this or to have any credit or worthiness left. So there'll be defaults, write-offs of debt. It's not going to be an easy period for the world economy for a while. So yeah, I think Vichy is unlikely in your recent book, uh, Women Versus Capitalism, uh, you put forward the view that women still face substantial obstacles uh, in terms of business and the economy in developing careers and going into positions of uh, influence. Do you anticipate that women might also get the harsh end of the economic impact of the COVID-19 crisis? But a lot of it, of course, is linked to the slowdown in the economy. The International Monetary Fund has calculated that uh, at times of recession and slowdown, women suffer most. Uh, and, of course, they tend to be the poorest members of society because there is a big wage gap and they do the types of jobs which are the margin of society quite a lot or they work at home, uh, not paid, and they're the ones who are most likely to fall into poverty. So, yes, I worry. And what is happening also in the developed world is that uh, quite a lot of the pressures for gender equality seem to um, have eased a little bit right now and, and probably will not be at the forefront of any recovery that takes place. We've seen here in the UK, for example, the, the requirement for big firms to publish their pay reviews, which show the gaps that they have in their organisations between men and women, has been delayed. And that, of course, is a worry. Are we going to be going backwards uh, rather than forwards? And how long will it take for that recovery again in the position of women that has been lagging so behind uh, take place? And will it be slowed down because of this? And those are the main concerns. And if you look at data, it does suggest indeed that women and the young have been the worst affected in this crisis. Join us after the break, where we continue our discussion with economist Vicky Price. Welcome back. I'm discussing with Vicky Price, the former head of the Government Economic Service in the United Kingdom, about the efficacy of the financial policies being pursued by governments around the world. Will they result in a V-shaped uh, recovery, or are we more set for a, a bout of prolonged recession? Vicky Price, do you uh, anticipate that uh, when the bills have to be settled uh, at some point uh, after the crisis is over, that uh, policymakers around the world will be looking for different means of, uh, of raising taxations to close some of the substantial fiscal gaps. Are there any opportunities in terms of the economics effect of the crisis, for example, a renewed interest in carbon taxes, uh, given the uh, substantial fall in the resource price that might offer themselves as more attractive policy options than normal? From an economic viewpoint, it's a carbon tax that we need. There's no doubt about it, because that, of course, encourages all sorts of behaviours 
uh, that make it much more likely that we get to a solution which will use less fossil fuel or even move into the area of carbon capture and storage or alternative uh, fuels that you can get out of fossil fuels that can be used in a, you know, in a certain way by not being as polluting as just oil and gas are at the present. There is a huge opportunity to construct an industrial policy in various countries that is greener in the future than what we had before, if we are indeed to meet some of the climate change targets that uh, have been set in many countries by law, uh, which certainly is the case in the UK. So I see both as an opportunity, but also as a worry that in the attempts to get growth back, we might forget uh, what we've learned perhaps from this crisis. On the same theme, what changes would you expect to see in the economies once this crisis is, is finally over? Well, one interesting one would be what happens to the way we work. Um, there is now a serious discussion about whether one needs this commercial property that's out there. One shatters the thing what this will mean for all our pensions, um, given that quite a lot of money is invested in property, certainly in the UK, but in many advanced nations too. Uh, but would it mean that we work more from home? I think what is very interesting is looking at developments in some countries. Germany, for example, is thinking of uh, legislating that people can, as of right, work from home if that's what they want. Maybe globalization will go backwards because we need to be close to our supply chains. Maybe there'll be a lot more onshoring. All these things that are now sort of puzzling people, how exactly do we make it work? And also the role of the state much bigger role um, because so many companies are going to be requiring a system, they already are, um, and they will find it difficult to stand on their own two feet or however many they've got um, if that support is withdrawn. And I think the banking system will look different too. Um, they're going to have quite a lot of difficulty getting any of their loans back, even though they're guaranteed by the state in many places. Um, and then the consumer might just change their habits. Um, I think they still want to go out and eat. Uh, but they might be much, much more careful how they spend that money in the future. Um, and they'll be worried about this type of event happening again. So I think psychology will play a very important role here. Confidence with the terms will be a great thing, but it will take some time. Vicky Price from London, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us on the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you. Now, in the aftermath of this extraordinary economic crisis, which has followed the global pandemic, will new economic thinking emerge uh, as countries come to terms with the full economic ramifications of COVID-19? I turn to George Caravan, a leading economic thinker in Scotland and a former SNP Member of Parliament. George Caravan joins me from Edinburgh. Now, the big economies, uh, all economies, have wheeled out the, the big guns in order to confront the economic consequences of lockdown. But in these unprecedented positions uh, of a, an induced world recession, induced as a deliberate act of policy, isn't this exactly the, the moment where central banks are justified in a substantial asset purchases, quantitative easing, a printing money. Isn't this the, exactly the situation where that unprecedented action is justified? I think you're right. And what, what amazed me was how quickly, I mean, it was a matter of you know, microseconds before um, the big central banks went back to cranking up the money machine, trying to pump more cash into the economy. The trouble is, They'd already used that mechanism over the last decade. They'd got interest rates down to rock bottom. So though more money is being printed now, it's essentially going to, to replacing lost taxes during the lockdown. It's not actually adding extra demand to the global economy in a way that would expand investment and expand output, which is why I think ultimately the solution, if you want to get the global economy back on track and growth back up to trend, is going to be more in an immediate fiscal injection, uh, not, not monetary policy, not essentially keeping interest rates down, which is what monetary policy has been used for to date. I think um, governments are going to have to use the money they're printing 
uh, from the central banks and pump it directly into the economy, directly into investment, directly into purchases. Interest rates are already at, at rock bottom, Alex. So what we need to do is to put money directly into spending. And you're seeing some governments begin to do that. Chinese governments began to do that. Even Trump's uh, government has begun to do that in America. Uh, not so much yet in Europe. But turning to the UK economics uh, this now, while criticism has been mounting against the Prime Minister's handling of the crisis, the Chancellor has been getting rave reviews. The new Chancellor of the Exchequer seems to be the, the darling of much of the media commentary. Is that praise justified or is there more that should be being done by the UK Exchequer? Uh, actually, um, the Bank of England has just been given the Chancellor cash directly. So he's got no shortage of, of, of spending power at the moment. And if you feel shortage of spending power, then, then you could look good. I think the real the test for the Chancellor over. is what the happens after continue. the lockdown. It could well be the that UK. the Chancellor thinks he can resort to an old-fashioned gambit, which is to boost inflation. And, of course, if inflation goes up in, in the medium term, then the value of the debt that the government has contracted will, will, will fall in real terms. Um, so I, I, I think the Chancellor might find it hard to raise taxes and freeze um, public sector pay uh, in the immediate aftermath of the, uh, of the lockdown. But I think uh, he might look cannily towards uh, a little bit of inflation to help the economy along. What sign of new and different thinking do you see, George Caravan, emerging from this crisis? I cannot imagine there's the political will to go back to another bout of austerity. Uh, to pay off uh, the substantial sums of money that governments have borrowed uh, across the world. Um, so there's going to have to be an other ways of funding government from now on. Now, there's a new, a new set of, thing, of theories called mo modern monetary theory. Uh, and essentially, it says that it's actually quite a good thing for governments to borrow, because when they borrow, um, they are issuing government bonds, and those bonds are a kind of wealth. Uh, and just to be very simple, simplified about it, you know, where does your pension come from? You're, 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 you have to save. Uh, how, what can you save in? Well, you buy, you know, your, your pension fund buys government bonds. Government borrowing um, is actually quite a good thing because on the long term, it underpins people's pensions. So there might well be a rethink across the world about borrowing, government borrowing, and, making, and seeing it as a, as a more positive thing uh, that we've seen in the era of austerity over the last 20 years. But that would be a very substantial change in economic thinking. I mean, when the economies have been as indebted as they will be emerging from this crisis, after the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, after the World Wars of the 20th century, then haven't they tended to be followed by a period of austerity which has been justified on the basis of balancing the books? Well, I mean, the curious thing, uh, uh, if you look at the Second World War, which is the bit I can remember, um, uh, there the, the, the was, the was an initial view that, yes, you know, having borrowed vast amounts of money, I mean, the British national uh, debt was running at, at twice of GDP, I mean, twice what it is at the moment. Um, there the, the, was an Im immediate thought, well, maybe we'll have to, you know, tighten our belts and, and, and pay all this off. But, I mean, that actually didn't happen at the end of the Second World War. Um, they, we more or less grew our way out of it. The Americans, um, uh, bless their cotton socks, came up with a Marshall Plan and, and came up with a lot of money in, uh, initially. Um, but by the, by the, the 1950s, um, we were actually borrowing a lot more. Uh, we'd moved over to funding the economy through um, personal debt, uh, and that the huge wadge of public debt left over from fighting the war, they, that was just left there really through to the end of the 1960s. And it gradually lost its, um, its um, real value um, through inflation. So the, actually, you know, the lesson of the Second World War is that um, we didn't really rush to austerity. Uh, we had 20 or 30 years of, of quite positive growth and inflation and let the debt mountain just uh, disappear in real terms. Uh, I suspect there will be um, a debate over, you know, um, uh, austerity versus growing the economy. Uh, I think that the bankers, who always get kind of conservative about this, uh, might be pressure, pressuring the, the chancellor to, to, to move towards austerity. 
Um, but I think you will find it very difficult in political terms to get away with that once we've all come out of lockdown. So I, I think we're into a new political era and there'll be big debates about how to get out of this. And I think political movements that just simply want to go back to the old austerity line of business, I think they will find it very difficult to achieve that. And finally, George Canavan, if you were still gracing the green benches of the House of Commons, what policy, single policy prescription would you be offering to the, the Chancellor as a, uh, as a way of uh, helping to come out of this economic crisis? And what policy option do you believe the Scottish Government should be pursuing to show that they've uh, got new thinking to meet these different times? Well, the policy that has bubbled up and is now, is now being discussed north and south of the border uh, is introducing uh, a universal basic income. The idea being, you just, let's get rid of all the, all the baggage and the bureaucracy of, uh, of the different welfare systems, which don't work anyway, uh, which put people through misery trying to you know, fill in all the forms, uh, and which are means-tested. Let's just have a basic income that everybody gets, uh, which takes care of basic needs, and that, in, in a sense, saves you a lot of money because you can get rid of a lot of the bureaucracy. Um, it saves you a lot of the mental health problems of putting people through these hoops uh, and actually creates a, you know, a kind of a, 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 a civic coming together uh, so that people can, can begin to concentrate on rebuilding the economy, um, thinking up new ideas for rebuilding the economy and so on. So I think universal basic income is going to become the issue that we'll all be discussing over the next period. Uh, I noticed that the... Uh, the, the new um, Social Justice and Fairness Commission that the Scottish Government has set up uh, is discussing this. Uh, and I think um, I'm looking forward in time, uh, uh, um, we are going to see that major change occurring in actually how the welfare state is organised. Josh Caravan from Edinburgh, thank you very much for joining us once again on The Alex Salmon Show. We can now see pretty clearly the, the shape of the world economic response to the onset of the COVID-19 crisis. Most finance ministers have aimed howitzers at the pandemic with varying degrees of success. The real question is the durability of the crisis. And those countries which have been pretty successful in containing the virus, Taiwan, South Korea, Germany, Greece, New Zealand, are still looking with trepidation and those countries in Western Europe, the United States of America, which are still struggling, and indeed at the increasing signs that South America is being gripped by the pandemic. They know, the successful countries know, that world economic recovery depends on world control of the virus. In that sense, we are most definitely all in this together. In the UK, increasing questions are being asked as to why it's only now, three months into the crisis, that the comprehensive system of contact tracing is only just getting off the ground. Control of the virus stomping down in the infection would seem to be a prerequisite for economic recovery, not an afterthought. There is little point at aiming big guns at the economy if it's pea shooters which are being aimed at public health. And so from Tasmina, myself and all at the show, it's goodbye for now, stay safe and we'll see you again next week.